Hare Krishna everyone. Welcome to Pariprashna. So Pariprashna is a brand new podcast series wherein we intend to share ancient wisdom for modern people. Since time immemorial, the way Vedic wisdom has been imparted is through conversations. Be it the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Shukadeva Goswami and Mara Maharaj Parikshit on the bank of the Ganges, Suta Goswami and the Shaunakadi Rishis in Naimisharanya, Philosophical truths have been shared between a sincere seeker and an empowered teacher through deep and engaging conversations. So Pariprashna is a very humble attempt to do exactly that by way of inquiring about scriptures and seeking relatable and relevant answers. Pariprashna is a Sanskrit word which means to inquire. So Krishna tells Arjuna in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, he is saying, if you want to know the truth about absolute uh, nature, then you have to inquire. Uh, in fact, the very purpose of human life is to inquire into the higher realms of truth. Athato Brahma Jignyasa. So the very first scripture that we will be inquiring about is Srimad Bhagavad Gita. And the objective is to try and cover maybe one chapter per episode. While I will be the one putting forth the questions, very special devotee with us who will actually be enlightening us with answers. And that very special devotee joining us is His Grace Kamalochan Prabhu. So Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. So I know that Kamalochan Prabhu is quite a well-known devotee. But however, for the benefit of those who don't know much about him, let me give a brief introduction of his. So in Srimad Bhagavatam, Kunti Devi says, Janmaishwarya Shruta Shri Bhir Edamana Madhapuman. She says, Janma, a respectable uh, birth, then Aishwarya, great wealth, then uh, Shruta, high education, and Shri, bodily beauty, these things can become a cause of one's pride. So Kamalochan Prabhu is actually someone who had all these. He was born into a into an orthodox Madhva Brahmin family. He was raised in great opulence. He was very well educated, but he left them all behind to answer the higher calling of life by taking the path that is less traveled, and that is to pursue the path of spirituality. Leaving his lucrative job as a marine engineer, he joined ISKCON in the year 1997. He is a disciple of His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. As a testimony for his expert and dedicated service, right from the get-go, he has been assigned roles with increasing responsibilities over time. Currently, he is serving as the president of ISKCON Mira Road and ISKCON Wapi. He also happens to be the zonal supervisor of Uttar Pradesh East. And he is a prolific teacher. So he is serving as a teacher in Vrindavan Institute of Education, VIHE, and ISKCON Bhagavat Mahavidyalai, IBMV. He also happens to be a sannyasa candidate. I see that he is very passionate about spiritual education for children and also restoring the lost glory for mother cow, Gomata, in a very practical way that makes economic sense. So he's also, a, he travels quite extensively. And as he is traveling in Bharat and outside of Bharat, he also gives a lot of wonderful discourses. In fact, he is very well known for his profound scriptural discourses that nourishes the intellect of devotees. So how does he manage to do so many things while having managerial responsibilities? Well, that's truly mind-blowing. He was also instrumental in the construction of this beautiful temple in Iskan Mira Road. So if you haven't visited, whenever you're in Mumbai, you should put it on your list to go visit. And currently, he's overseeing the construction of yet another amazingly beautiful temple, Sri Sri Radha Govind Mandir Iskan Temple in Wapi, Gujarat. And now, these are just a few glimpses, few things about his external accomplishments for the pleasure of Guru Parampara. But actually, I must say that his internal work, what he has become as a devotee in terms of his character, now that far outweighs his external accomplishments. Somewhere, I heard Kamalochan Prabhu say that even before joining ISKCON, uh, when he was working as a marine engineer, he would go on reciting over and over again, several hundreds of times, the shlokas from chapter 12 of Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna is describing the wonderful devotional qualities that are dear to him. 
and now from being non envious to humility to being carefree aniketaha nirmamo nirahankaraha kshami equanimity so he is living and exemplifying these vaishnava qualities so truly kamalochan prabhu is a great inspiration not just for me but many devotees like me so prabhu thank you so very much for setting such a wonderful example for all of us to follow so it's a great honor and a special privilege for me for me to be able to sit like this and have a conversation with you in fact a little over 6 years ago i didn't even know who you were i stumbled upon one of your interviews on youtube and then 6 years later by krishna and prabhupad's divine arrangement i am getting to sit down and actually have a conversation with you like this so i'm really thankful and i feel blessed uh, so thank you for agreeing to be part of pari prashna prabhu hari krishna hari krishna so prabhu my very first question to you before getting into bhagavad gita how did your uh, how did you come in touch with bhagavad gita specifically bhagavad gita as it is and then how has your relationship with bhagavad gita evolved over time yeah it was in mayapur uh, in 1993 i remember that uh, we had a yoga retreat camp for 3 days uh, from our college to mayapur temple so we had a three days camp there and uh, on the way back from mayapur to calcutta this jagannath temple is there in mayapur this mayapur uh, uh, jagannath temple so there uh, we were given a, a copy of bhagavad gita to uh, to all our students so i got the book and then i wanted to see what is there inside it and then started reading the bhagavad gita because i had a habit of reading a lot I thought in many books I am reading and read this also, but somehow uh, after reading the entire Bhagavad Gita for the next six days, I completed the entire book reading three, four, five hours a day, but I could not understand anything out of it. Nothing, not a single thing I understood. But I felt that there is something very interesting in that, because one point where Krishna says, "Jatasya drum rutur drum jano rutas chicha." of course there is a very internal meaning to that words but still the external meaning says jatasya dhruva mrityu for a person is born that is certain of course it's very uh, interesting because it talks about life so then um, after um, uh, going to mayapur again next after 15 days or so then i expressed my desire saying that i am not able to understand this bhagavad gita uh then what to do so then, then i got a book called chaitanya charitamrita on teachings of lord chaitanya edition of uh, the um, chaitanya charitamrita is a uh, have many volumes so that is the, that book that is called teachings of lord chaitanya that made me understand the bhagavad gita It's very interesting because krishna spoke the bhagavad gita and the same krishna comes and then teaches bhagavad gita by practicing bhagavad gita in his life as chaitanya mahapur so krishna coming as chaitanya and teaching bhagavad gita by practically applying bhagavad gita in his life that is very interesting so that teachings of lord chaitanya became a light for me to uh, get into the verses of the bhagavad gita so from that day onward raft reading teachings of lord chaitanya every verse of bhagavad gita was as right as a sun itself so this is how my journey uh, bhagavad gita started and i always say that there are many 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 scriptural scriptures uh, many books on spirituality uh, you may read on and off but that one book which is bhagavad gita that is a textbook for life is a textbook for life and that is one book which uh which i make sure i read every day at least in a, at least one words a day there is bhagavatam there is chaitanya charitamrita there are so many varieties of scriptural books are there but one book which i make sure that at least one words i read every day along with the purport that is the bhagavad gita wonderful prabhu excellent so clearly uh, bhagavad gita has gr- had a great impact it continues to have a great influence in your life in my life and so many others but however prabhu uh, what do you have to say to those people who are actually good people hard working people 
but they have a lot of things that they are juggling right they are climbing the corporate ladder they have to raise a family they have to maintain relationships earn money social obligations so somewhere among all these you know juggling too many things seems like they have neither the interest nor the time to learn bhagavad gita so what are these people losing by not having the knowledge of bhagavad gita in their life why do they have to make bhagavad gita a priority in their busy life the very scene of the bhagavad gita itself is a proof that they require bhagavad gita bhagavad gita doesn't discourage anyone from going high in the corporate life doesn't discourage anyone to raise his family take care of the family rather it actually helps us in doing all these things because in the bhagavad gita arjuna wanted to give up to raise in the political ladder uh, for you it may be corporate ladder for arjuna it was a political ladder for a student it may be the ladder of academics so everybody is trying to climb some ladder or other for arjuna it was a political ladder and he did not want to climb it the arjuna who actually told it is krishna it is krishna who told arjuna the bhagavad gita that you have to climb the ladder but how to climb the ladder what is the attitude in which you have to climb the ladder that is more important see in this world activity is not very important the consciousness the attitude behind the activity that is important if you don't have proper attitude towards life then even though you may climb any ladder even though you may raise your family you will be suffering like anything because you don't know what are the uh, what is the purpose of doing all these things if you don't know the purpose of climbing the corporate ladder you will be tired of it so you should know it the purpose of life the life means you have to deal with people you have to deal with money you have to have a house you have to have relatives you have to have so many uh, uh, social political economic responsibilities how to take up those responsibilities with the proper attitude that is actually life just trying to climb a ladder a political ladder or a corporate ladder that itself is not life uh, that is why those who are trying to climb a corporate ladder or having a family and they're all frustrated in spite of their hard work what is the reason for it somebody gets married they have children but still they're frustrated what is the reason for it the reason is not these things the reason is not the corporate world it is the reason is not your wife or the husband or children for your frustration the reason is you not having a proper attitude towards them you not having a proper consciousness uh, in in trying to doing do this very nice so prabhu we, before we actually get into the first chapter i have a couple of generic questions and then we'll get into first chapter so i find the setting and the timing in which bhagavad gita uh, in which krishna spoke bhagavad gita extremely fascinating so actually krishna is quite a revolutionary because usually we see philosophical discussion is something that happens in a very peaceful atmosphere somewhere in the deep of the jungle like on the bank of some river or somewhere in an ashram but however here is krishna speaking to arjuna deep philosophical truths but where amidst the battlefield of kurukshetra where there are horses and elephants and all these warriors and not only the setting even the timing actually krishna spoke gita when both the sides had already blown the conch shells kauravas and pandavas had blown we thought okay now uh, they are going to fight and at this time at this critical juncture krishna speaks bhagavad gita so what is your take on this unique setting and also the urgency with which krishna gives the message of gita life is a war it's not easy life is a war because we are all fighting you tell me one family one corporate sector office where everything is very peaceful no way even in the jungle there is no peace you have a tiger your lion okay you when you think that there is a very peaceful place which i want to go your mind is not peaceful so it is it's a situation of war Uh, and how to face the situation of war that is what is bhagavad gita 
So that is why Krishna chose the battlefield of Kurukshetra to teach the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna because everybody can relate to it. If it had been a very peaceful place and everything is so nice for Arjuna, uh, where Krishna is speaking something, why anybody would relate to Bhagavad Gita? I can relate to Bhagavad Gita only when there is something in it for me. And everybody is in a situation of crisis. Everybody is in a situation of a war. Whether it may be a housewife, it may be a businessman, a politician, and you name, you name a person. Uh, like, for example, we had a, uh, we have students who had given the neat examination. Uh, recently, it was a big chaotic situation in that country. Just imagine, uh, millions of students, they underwent so much of trauma in their life in spite of they being very intelligent, in spite of they being uh, in a very affluent families, uh, uh, they, they are all, they are all, and they don't have any big responsibilities. But still, they went into such a great uh, uh, psychological uh, depression, anxiety. How, how, how are they going to face it? And that is a time when Bhagavad Gita helps us. So it may be a small boy. It may be just a, a five-year-old boy. How much anxiety he has when he has to face the mother, when the mother comes to know that he has, he has told some lie. Huh? So you may say he's a small kid, but it's a, it's a trauma for him. It's very difficult for him to face. So whether it is a five-year-old boy, a 50 year old man or woman, whoever it may be in this world, they are all in a crisis and everybody is actually fighting a war. So Krishna... He spoke the Bhagavad Gita in the battlefield of, battlefield of Kurukshetra so the people in future, they can relate to the Bhagavad Gita so that they see that Bhagavad Gita is for me. Otherwise, why anybody should read the Bhagavad Gita? Why they should waste their time? That is the reason. So what about the timing, Prabhu? Why just before the war is beginning? So that is what Krishna, he tells Arjuna. Anadyushtam asvargya makirti karamarjuna upasthitam the, 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 the situation in which you are saying I don't want to fight Vishame, that kind of situation what you have now is that you already agree that I'm going to fight and then now you say I'm not going to fight what is this? so we all agreed that I am going to face the situation of war. For example, somebody joins the, a course uh, of engineering or medical. He has agreed. Now, when the course or syllabus examinations come, they become afraid of it. No, I cannot face it. Taking anxiety. No, you have agreed. You, when, you, when you are living your life, you agree that I am going to face the challenges. Vishameya Pastitam means the, the situation of war has come not because the situation has come on its own accord. You have agreed for it. The moment you are born, you have agreed to fight and face the world. So don't look back. So the situations are not because of someone else. It is because you have chosen to face the situation. And now, after you have chosen to face a situation, you want to go back, withdraw, it is not good. You wanted to become an army officer. Very good. You joined the army. When the war came, and you say, no, no, I cannot fight. No, when you joined the army, you have accepted that I am going to fight the war when the situation arrives. The moment you... The child is admitted to the school and the child says, I'll go to the school. Then he has agreed that I'm going to face the examination. That the challenges I am going to face. So that is why he chose the timing. So don't be a fool. It is going to give you Anarya, Dushtam, Akirti Karam, Aswargyam, Akirti Karam Arjuna, Aswargyam. In the next life also you will not be happy. And in this life also people will say you are a fool, you are a lost person. 
that is the reason he chose the time very nice very nice Uh, so prabhu why does the title of every single chapter of bhagavad gita all 18 chapters end with the same word yoga yoga in fact this is one of the words that is used very often throughout bhagavad gita yukta yoga and in fact uh, when we say om tat sad iti shrimad bhagavad gita so upanishad so brahma vidyayam we say yoga shastra so it is a yoga shastra so what is the significance of this word yoga yoga it has got its root word in yuj yuj means to connect see the moment you connect with krishna that becomes yoga you connect with krishna through your work that is called karma yoga you connect with krishna through your knowledge that is called gyana yoga you connect with krishna through ashtanga that is known as ashtanga yoga you connect with krishna out of love that is known as bhakti yoga as simple as that now you may say why we should connect with krishna as i have told in the previous uh, question that we are all spiritual sparks and we are all spiritual sparks of the fire called krishna krishna says in the bhagavad gita mamai vamsho jivaloke jivuta sanatanah mamai vamshah we are all amshas of krishna as long as we are connected to krishna the spiritual spark that is that is bright that is shining that that brings out your qualities or spiritual qualities the moment you are disconnected from krishna as a spark it gets disconnected from the fire it loses its 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 its, uh, its brightness the same way any electrical equipment when it is collect, connected to the main source of electricity that is a plug point it functions if it is not connected though it is the same equipment it doesn't have any value that is what in every verse of bhagavad gita in every chapter of bhagavad gita in the hint which is given in fact it is a hint which is given that is you get connected to krishna get connected to krishna by hook or crook in whatever way you want to get connected get connected to krishna when you get connected to krishna gradually gradually what happens is the complete manifestation of your natural spiritual potencies will come when you develop that love for krishna connecting with krishna out of love that is called bhakti so that is the reason uh, yoga shastra so bhagavad gita is a book of yoga the yoga means connection to krishna you connect to krishna through your work karma yoga connect to krishna through your um, uh, knowledge that is known as gyana yoga connect to krishna through ashtanga that is known as ashtanga yoga connect to krishna out of love which is the perfection of life where when you connect with krishna through love which is known as bhakti yoga that is a complete manifestation of uh, uh, your spiritual potencies it is here hidden in you very nice so karma yoga gnana yoga bhakti yoga ashtanga yoga all this makes perfect sense but however chapter 1 is called arjuna vishada yoga so vishada is lamentation so arjuna goes into lamentation after seeing everyone so how can somebody's vishada that is lamentation become a cause of yoga union with krishna yes it is the most interesting chapter of all 18 chapters why what is the reason for it the reason is krishna by having a conversation with arjuna in the first chapter actually he dis- he tells the entire world that even a person like arjuna requires bhagavad gita then what to speak of only people like us generally as soon as some problem comes in our life we think that that i can find the solution by myself my money my strength my intelligence can find some solution for the problems of this world as long as we try to find some solution from our own mental faculty our own intelligence and decide that by my money by my my strength i am going to solve the problems of life you are going to increase the problems so krishna wanted to tell the entire world even though you may be like arjuna who has got pashupatastra you have to hear bhagavad gita 
because Bhagavad Gita is a textbook of life. And you are living life, so you have to read it. All the so-called material qualifications and assets what you have, they have zero value in solving the problems of life without the study of Bhagavad Gita. As much as if you don't have electricity, if you don't connect universal electricity, you may have the best of the of, of the electrical equipment. You may have fan, you may have air conditioner. Without electricity, they are not, no use. So that is the reason which Krishna, he actually specifically talks about the Vishada Yoga. Hmm. Even a person like Arjuna has Vishada. Vishada means lamentation, misery. Uh, he is having problems. And he is not able to solve the problems. So, one good thing uh, which Arjuna did is he approached Krishna. So, that is how this Vishada of Arjuna became yoga. Generally, when somebody is in distress, either they surrender to Krishna or they surrender to somebody else or something else. Most of them, when they become very distressed and depressed, they take shelter of alcohol or some intoxication or some inter entertainment, etc. But that is not going to give any solution. So everybody in this world is distressed. Everybody is in the Vishada. To come to the platform of understanding Krishna and study the Bhagavad Gita. And that is why Vishada becomes yoga. Like a doctor, the stomach of a patient is going to give so much of pain to the patient. But the pain is for the future uh, happiness. Uh, the same way, uh, the Vishada, when you surrender to Krishna, that Vishada becomes yoga. It is for your future happiness. That is why Vishada becomes yoga. And what to speak of this? Arjuna Vishada Yoga is a part of the Jnana Yoga. It is not that Vishada Yoga is a separate yoga. It is a part of Jnana Yoga because the knowledge means to understand three things. Matter, spirit and controller. Matter means this world. So the understanding of this world is to understand this world is Dukkhalaya Shashvata. It is miserable and it is also temporary. So though Arjuna Vishada Yoga is a separate yoga, it can be categorized as the part of Jnana Yoga. Wow. The chapter title itself is so profound, so I really can't wait to get into the chapter. So Prabhu, let's start with the first chapter, first shloka. So we see that whether it is a movie or a book or a speech or an article, so any good director or speaker, writer, they pay a lot of attention to the opening because that is where you actually grab the attention of the audience. And now, Vyasa Dev, I mean, he's composed like Vedas, Puranas, Itihasas, Upanishads. So he is a genius. He's an incarnation of God. So he, of all the people who could have started Bhagavad Gita, he chooses the first verse of the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita to be spoken by an evil person like Dhritarashtra. And also of all the 700 shlokas, this is the only shloka spoken by Dhritarashtra. So I'm really curious to know why the first chapter for shloka starts with Dhritarashtra and also what is the significance of this shloka uttered by Dhritarashtra? Dharmakshetre, Kurukshetre, Samaveda, Yudhsavaha, Mamata, Pandava, Shiva, Kimakurvata, Sanjaya spoken by Dhritarashtra. So the significance of why Bhagavad Gita starts with the words spoken by a villain. Hmm, that is the question. It is because to show to the entire world the reality of this world. What is the reality? The reality is those who love you based on ignorance of Bhagavad Gita or those who don't study Bhagavad Gita, those who don't practice Bhagavad Gita, their love is actually not love. It is only a big drama. To show to the entire world that the so-called love in this world is actually not love. Hmm. No one loves you in this world. They do a drama that I love you. 
and after some time the same person hates you so it's a big drama we can see an young boy falls in love with a young girl and this young girl falls in love with a young boy they give up their families because their families both of their families parents they are not agreeing to their uh, getting married they run away from their house to get married only to get divorced after a few months what happened to them now where did it go was it really there it is not there so this thing krishna wants to tell to the entire world that is why he made the trashtra speak this verse that is how he is making a nice wonderful background or a bhumika uh, platform where he can speak this knowledge of bhagavad gita because when you show the real devilish nature of the material world uh, then you should then you can he can teach you how to deal with it actually the whole world is very devilish how to deal with that starts with an understanding of the devil what the, the devilish nature of this world so without understanding the nature of this world how can you teach how to deal with this world to to teach with a person how to live in this world how to deal with this world you have to teach what is the reality of this world if i have to teach you how to operate a car then i have to teach you first about what is the nature of this car if i have to teach you how to deal with an atom bomb then i have to tell what what this atom bomb is all about mm -hmm. so in summary the entire world is nothing but filled with those who say i love you but it is just only for sense enjoyment their own selfish nature so the secret to this first verse is mamaka pandava chiva externally if you see the trashtra is saying mamaka oh my sons and pandavas now the trashtra knew very well his sons are going to die in the battle in the kurukshetra he knew very well then why is he asking kima purvata sanjaya oh sanjay what did they do they he is uh, he is saying that they have assembled to fight at the same time he says hey what did they do tell me he is so fearful not of their sons losing the war but he is so confident that his sons are going to not only lose the war but also is so confident is they are going to die because mm -hmm. he sees it is dharma kshetra Purukshetra is Dharma Kshetra. He knew very well my sons are on the side of Adharma, and he knew Dharma Kshetra will will not let his sons survive in the battle. He was so fearful that his sons would go to Dharma Kshetra and have gone to Dharma Kshetra, uh, and then would compromise being influenced by Dharma. He was so fearful of his sons becoming Dharmikas. That was his fear. Why he may lose his seat? So his love was actually not for his sons, but his love was for his own seat. So when somebody loves you, say, "Ye mere mama hai, my uncle. Ye mere kaka hai. Ye mere pita ji hai." No. Actually, you want to say, "Ye mere kam ke hai." Instead of that. They would say different, different words. My friend, he is my friend. He is my mother. She is my mother. He is my uncle. No, he is of my use to me. As soon as you come to know, there is no use to that person. No, no connection. So that is the uh, real nature uh, of this love in this world. That is what Krishna wants to project through the first verse, and he. He was the drastha to speak this words. Those are some hard-hitting truths, actually. The naked truth of this world is bared out in the very first sloka, and that too, if Dhritarashtra's verse only can be so deep, 
I mean, what about now Arjuna and Krishna and Sanjaya's verses? The Bhagavad Gita is really truly profound. And you have spoken like a true sadhu in a recent podcast of yours. You said sadhu means who cuts the knots. So this is really like hard-hitting truths that really bears everything. So Prabhu, moving on from the first shloka, the next few shlokas is a display of Duryodhana's diplomacy. So as much as first chapter is Arjuna Vishada Yoga, we know that it can also be called Sainya Nirikshana Yoga. So the first person who does Sainya Nirikshana viewing of the military arrangement is Duryodhana. And Duryodhana, interestingly, I want to read exactly what Prabhupada writes in his purport after Duryodhana does his quote-unquote Sainya Nirikshana. So Prabhupada writes, Duryodhana's diplomatic veneer could not disguise the fear he felt when he saw the military arrangement of the Pandavas. So the emotion Duryodhana felt is fear, but he is covering it up with his diplomatic talks. So my question was, now if we were to compare Pandavas and Kauravas, if we saw the military strength, Kauravas had 11 Akshohinis as versus Pandavas who had only 7. And if we see in terms of experienced generals, Kauravas had people like Bhishma, Drona, whom Parikshit Maharaj calls in Bhagavatam. They were like Timingulas in front of my grandfather. And even if we see the last 13 years before the war broke out, it was Duryodhana who was in charge of the treasury and he was actually in charge of power. While Pandavas, for 13 years, they were in exile. So on so many different fronts, if we see, it is clearly Kauravas, Duryodhana, who had an upper hand. But however, in spite of all that, Duryodhana is so fearful. But here, on the other hand, we see Pandavas, they are completely fearless. So what is the cause of Duryodhana's fear and Pandavas' fearlessness? Uh, Prabhu, can you hear me, Prabhu? Your video seems to be frozen and my internet connection is a little unstable. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu, you can continue. I could not uh, really hear the question completely because yes, yes. last part of the uh, interest uh, was sound was breaking. Yes, I'll repeat that question. Prabhu. So the question yeah. was, so as much as uh, chapter one is called Arjuna Vishada Yoga, it is also Sainya Nirikshana Yoga. And the first person who does Sainya Nirikshana here is uh, Duryodhana. So I just wanted to read what Prabhupada writes in his purport. Uh, so after Duryodhana does his Sainya Nirikshana, so Prabhupada is writing, actually, uh, Duryodhana is trying to cover up his fear, the fear he felt with his diplomatic veneer. So if we see, if we compare Pandavas and Kauravas, in terms of military strength, Kauravas are the ones who had 11 Akshauhinis versus Pandavas 7 Akshauhinis. And then if we see in terms of experienced generals, Kauravas had an upper hand. There were people like Bhishma, Drona, whom Maharaj Parikshit in Bhagavatam calls. These are like Timingulas in front of my grandfather Arjuna. And then even in terms of power and treasury, it was Duryodhana who was in charge of the finances and power for the last 13 years before the war broke out. And Pandavas, they were in exile. So in spite of the Kauravas having an upper hand on so many fronts, still Duryodhana is feeling fear. But on the other hand, Pandavas are totally fearless. So what is the cause of Duryodhana's fear and Pandavas' fearlessness? Srila Prabhupada in a further purpose, when he says that Pradayani uh, Vedadhariyat, he says the reason is that uh, Pandavas' confidence in Krishna, that Krishna is going to protect uh, in all circumstances. So on the other hand, Duryodhana was uh, not having the confidence in Krishna. So he was dependent on the material facilities or the powers or whatever he had. So the, as long as we are dependent on somebody who is dependent on something and something is dependent on something, then you have fear because you know that this person whom I'm dependent on or these things which are dependent on are not going to save me. They are not protecting me. 
So the moment you are dependent, the person is totally independent. Krishna is Swara. So then you are fearless. Uh, so that is the reason Pandavas were having this fearlessness and, uh, and Duryodhana had this fear. And fear in this world manifests in the form of diplomacy or known as politics. So just see a person who is a politician, he has a fear. What is a fear? I may lose my post. So to protect his post, he is going to do anything for it. And for that, he would try to appreciate a person who is not worth appreciable. He is trying to uh, do something to instigate a fight among two people so that he can maintain his position, to divide people and then rule. So he just goes to any extent to maintain his position. And that is called politics. And politics is nothing but uh, uh, an endeavor by a person to cover up the fear what he has. So everybody in this world is actually having a fear. And to cover up the fear, they do all these political gimmicks. They tell lies, they try to do uh, harm to somebody through someone. Something is in his mind and he picks something else, picks something else and does something else. All these things are just because of fear. Fear is because of vidya vinimesha syad ishada pitasthipuritosthihi. When your consciousness, your mind is not thinking of Krishna, is thinking of Maya, something else, then fear comes. So everybody in this world is fearful because they are not thinking of Krishna. And the Pandavas were thinking of Krishna. Thinking of Krishna means they are so sure that Krishna will protect me in all circumstances. So that is why they are fearless. Prahlad Maharaj was not Krishna protect me. In all circumstances, Krishna is Avashya Rakshavi Krishna because he is the only person who is uh, dependent on himself. And everybody is dependent on somebody else. And if you are dependent on somebody else who is dependent on somebody else, then naturally fear will be there. And that leads to politics. Wow. So this is the secret of becoming fearless. Depend only on Krishna. Take his shelter. Very nice. So Prabhu, another thing that stands out in the display of Duryodhana's diplomacy is his world view. The first few shlokas is Duryodhana looking in like two filters, like these are my friends and these are my enemies. Here are my enemies, Bhima, Arjuna, Drupada, Virata, Yuyudana, this, this, this. And here are my friends, my friend Karana, Ashwatthama, Krupa and all these people. So even in our own lives, if we are uh, quite self-aware and if we observe, when we have this filter of seeing people as friends and enemies, a lot of time is wasted in maintaining friendships. I should not lose this relationship. What will happen if they stop liking me? I have to keep them in good terms. I have to please them. And on the other hand, trying to neutralize or defeat the enemies, keep them at bay, that they should not harm me. So what is the cause of this mentality of seeing people in terms of friends and enemies? And how does one overcome this limited mentality? Prahlad Maharaj speaks to his teachers and the teachers say that see our enemies are coming and trying to spoil your brain. Tell me who is that enemy? Then Prahlad Maharaj says Parahaswa iti maya krataha. So he is my enemy, Para. He is my friend, he is Swa. It is all the creation of Maya. Mm -hmm. uh, because we think that this person is my friend and the same friend later on becomes your enemy. And sometimes you think he's my enemy and after some time you make friendship with him. True. Actually, there is only one enemy that is our uncontrolled mind. And there's only one friend that is controlled mind. Krishna in the sixth chapter, he talks about it. That, uh, one who has not controlled the mind, and that mind which is uncontrolled, that is your enemy. So when you don't control the mind, when your mind is uncontrolled, this enemy uh, tells you, you see, he's your friend, and he's your enemy. 
So it is the enemy who is actually trying to defeat you by giving you this conception of friend and enemy. So the enemy is not enemy, the friend is not friend. The concept of seeing this person as enemy, this person as friend is actually the enemy of you. Mm. Lord Maharaj clearly says this thing. Uh, you would think that this person is enemy. Actually, the enemy is sitting in your mind only because you have uncontrolled mind. For example, there are two friends, so-called friends. Both would not start drinking alcohol without the other person. So can you say both friends are drinking alcohol together? No. Actually, they are both enemies to each other. Right. If they had been really friends, each one ever told, don't drink alcohol, it is not good for you. So how can there be a friendship among those people who are not Krishna conscious? Mm -hmm. They just can never be, it's all enemies. Few enemies getting together and smoking, few enemies getting together and then watching a movie, few enemies getting together and then having some so-called fun time. It is not, they are not friends. Rather, in this world, if there is your enemy, better that enemy makes you realize that this world is full of fear. So, in one way, your so-called enemy is actually your friend because that makes you realize that is a temporary world. Anything, I can lose anything at any time. So, better take shelter of Krishna. So, the real enemy is not your enemy. Not, not The real friend is not your friend. There is only one enemy, that is your uncontrolled mind, which convinces you that this is your friend, this is your enemy. And there is only one friend who is, that is controlled mind, who convinces you that Krishna is your real friend. Wow. Amazing. So Prabhu, a funny observation about the Ryodhana's talks is that out of nowhere, multiple times, Somehow or the other, he keeps bringing up Bhima's name. Of all the people he could have taken, the first name he took on Pandava's side was Bhima. Right? Atrashura, Maheshwasa, Bhima, Arjuna, Samayudi. Even before Arjuna, he took Bhima's name. And then suddenly in the 10th verse, out of nowhere, he compares Bhishma and Bhima. Aparyaptam, Tadasmakam, Balam, Bhishma, Birakshitam, Paryaptam, Tvidame, Tesham, Balam, Bhima, Birakshitam. I mean, like where? Bhishma is commander-in-chief, Bhima... And in terms of age, experience, so many things, position. So why is Duryodhana so obsessed with Bhima? Why does he keep on mentioning Bhima's name for no reason? Yeah, he is mentioning Bhima's name because he is obsessed with Bhima. 24 hours just thinking of Bhima. Because Bhima had taken a vow that I am going to kill you. So nobody took a vow that I am going to kill Duryodhana. Bhima took a vow that I am going to kill a vow. Uh, kill, kill Duryodhana. So naturally, Duryodhana would feel that uh, uh, he'll be obsessed with that. He is only afraid of Bhima. Of course, there are many, many reasons for it. To the philosophical reasons uh, uh, from the Madhva Bhashya, but from the storyline point of view, it is very simple. That is, uh, he was afraid. He was fearful. It is actually uh, the nature of this world. Is you think of a person who is the enemy more than the person who is your friend. That's right. Someone, you think of the person so much even though you are next to your beloved person. Uh, you, know, you're, you, you love your husband, husband is next to you, but you just think of you know, this person, this person, this person, and you show the anger on that person or to your uh, near one and <laughs> who loves you. So it is said in the Bhagavatam also, by Dvesha, your, your absorption in a person, by Dvesha is more than an absorption in a person to love. That is what Shishupal. Yes. Uh, even though Shishupal was having uh, uh, enviousness for Krishna, Nisha, Kimuta, Dokshaja, Priya. The gopis were absorbed in, in Krishna out of love. Shishupal was absorbed out of it. Uh, then what happened to Shishupal? Because of his absorption, Krishna gave liberation to uh, Shishupal. 
and here the gopis they love Krishna. So what about them? That is how it says. In one sense, your absorption in a person is more out of enviousness rather than absorption in a person whom you love. Mm. Very true. And Prabhu, now focusing uh, on 14th shloka, what a verse. I mean, the entry of Krishna and Arjuna is truly a sight to behold. This cover page so magnificent on the Bhagavad Gita. And then the shloka, Tata Shvetair Hayair Yukte Mahati Syandane Stitao Madhavas Pandavas Chaiva Divya Shankar Pradad Matoho. The white horses and this magnificent chariot given by Agni Dev. And where? In any movie, any book, anywhere, who introduces the chariot driver as the first? I mean, where a hero enters as a chariot driver? So this must be perhaps the most unique entry of a hero ever. So I just wanted to ask you that Krishna, who is actually the Supreme Lord, and he has taken such a menial position of becoming the chariot uh, driver of his dear devotee Arjuna. And here is Arjuna commanding him, ordering him. And in fact, uh, we know this famous story of the South Indian Brahmana. He was just, tears were trickling down his cheeks holding Bhagavad Gita and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw him and he said, my dear Brahmana, what is moving you to tears? What verse of Bhagavad Gita is moving you so much? And he said, actually, I don't know how to read. But however, when I just see this, when I behold this sight in front of me where Krishna is driving the chariot of Arjuna, I can't help but cry. So what kind of a God is this? who loves his devotees so much that he is willing to do anything for his devotees, including becoming a chariot driver for Arjuna, a doorkeeper for Bali Maharaj, or taking up another menial position in the Rajasuya Yajna of Yudhishthir. Like, what kind of a god is this? Please explain this love that Krishna has for his devotees. So, we have a, a general perception that God is great. But in what way God is great, that is not understood. God is great because he is willing to do anything to love his devotees. So there is one aspect of God called greatness, then aspect of God called sweetness. Now generally people think God should be great, but Bhagavad Gita, Krishna teaches us by his own Example, by being a charity of Arjuna, he says God is not just great, he is sweet. Mm. Sweetness of God is superior to his greatness. If you just see God as being great, then you will land up into a wrong conception of God. God is not just great, he is sweet. He is full of sweetness. So, that is the conception, that is the thing which Krishna wants to tell to the Bhagavad Gita. See, when you say God is great, you consider God to be a judge who punishes you for your wrong things and he appreciates you or rewards you for your good things. So, the greatness of God leads to this kind of concept. So, I do good, I get good, I get good. We are just in these two concepts of good and bad. But God is beyond, beyond great. He is sweet. That is why he forgives your faults. That is how it is merciful. God is merciful. And to, he is so sweet that he, for him, his relationship with his devotees is more important than his position of being God. You may see a yeah, high court judge. He is there in the high court. There is all the people around. The secretaries around him. The pewns around him. They are saying, oh Lord. Lawyers saying, oh Lord. And all this thing. He gives a judgment. Uh, saying that, uh, hang him till death. And once he comes home, then you want to meet him. And you uh, approach his uh, security guard and say, I want to meet The judge is busy. You are waiting for one hour and wanted to see what is he busy for? Why is he busy? 
somehow through the window you peep and see what's happening inside his house what is he doing the judge the judge is uh, has become a goda is become a horse for the grandson the grandson says oh dada ji you become a goda and he is like this goda to goda and the grandson is sitting on top of the bed and he is trying to beat the boy right? to go go and this is going like this and we saw he is a judge so he is a judge yes he is a great hmm. but more than his greatness is his sweetness so krishna is sweet definitely is great but his sweetness is far superior to his greatness this is the essence of bhagavad gita so you will fall in love with something which is sweet mm. the the the, pur- the purpose of the entire bhagavad gita is to fall in love with krishna if somebody is very great you have love but still you have some distance you maintain some distance yes hmm? you have love it's not there's no love it is there but that love with reverence makes you uh, uh, It keeps you at a, 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 some distance from Krishna, but if you love, just go and hug him. Huh? So that is what is called bhakti. Prema bhakti means the devotion which has no barriers of uh, any reverence, which manifests through the understanding of God is great, and that is manifested. This kind of love is manifested in the highest extent in the gopis of India. And that is what Krishna remembers the, them in the in the Bhagavad Gita. Mama, he comes, Shanam, Raja, Raja means Vrindavan. Hmm. So he is even thinking of the gopis in the battlefield of Kurukshetra and thinking of Raja. Of course, there is a different meaning. If you take a different meaning of Raja, that's right. how you come into it. But ultimately, uh, the essence is that God's greatness is fine, but His far superior His greatness is His sweetness. Yeah, truly sweet indeed. so as a display of this sweetness uh, then we see arjuna is ordering krishna he is demanding sena yor huba yor madye ratam sthapayame achyuta so he is saying please take my i don't think he said please but take my chariot between the two armies and now he says why he wants krishna to take the chariot between the two armies he says yavade tan nirikshaham he wants to do niriksha he wants to look who has come with the intention of fighting now why does arjuna want to see now hasn't he he already knows right that who has taken whose side what is the point in him wanting to take a look now because this quote and quote seeing what he wants to do nirikshha proves detrimental for arjuna because he goes into this ocean of lamentation confusion and then he just it's a downward slide from there so what are your thoughts on this prabhu ಸೇಮ್ಸ್ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ಟಾ
is krishna deliberately trying to put arjuna in illusion by making him lose his composure is that why he is taking right in front of bhishma drona pramukataha definitely arjuna uh, mind could be read by krishna arjuna's mind could be read by krishna mm -hmm. that is why krishna has been addressed there as rishi kesha where he knows the mind of arjuna and he knew that what is going to happen to arjuna very well ultimately we should know that krishna wanted to give bhagavad gita to all of us he wanted to give bhagavad gita to all of us so for that purpose he has to put arjuna into illusion so arjuna being a parshad of krishna he would never fall into illusion but he is put into illusion by the divine will of krishna so that he can give bhagavad gita to all of us through arjuna so definitely is all krishna's plan only okay 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 and then arjuna does his niriksha sainya nirikshana and then we see that he is displaying both physical and mental symptoms of stress he says my mouth is drying my skin is burning my limbs are quivering gandiva is slipping and my mind is reeling so all kinds of stressful symptoms so it's not like arjuna has not fought any war before i mean he's fought many many wars bloodshed is not new to him fighting is not new to him in fact one of his name is vijaya he has never tasted defeat sometimes single handedly he has attained victory so what is so different about this particular war the war of kurukshetra that he is displaying such symptoms to the extent that gandiva is slipping from his hand and he is refusing to fight so when somebody is into illusion then all these symptoms are manifest illusion means that you forget your duty towards krishna so krishna is telling arjuna to fight but arjuna says i don't want to fight so illusion means this at the same time in that illusion which arjuna had krishna had some flavor in it the flavor is that arjuna is showing symptoms of goodness especially he says to krishna that kim no rajyena govinda kim bhogai jeevitena va what is the use of this world what is the use of this enjoyment when you are with me so goodness is very much required for a person to understand the knowledge of soul to understand the spirituality you require goodness so very unique situation krishna has put arjuna in one is he is in ignorance at the same time he is in a in a, in a uh, mode of goodness mm -hmm. so in one sense to summarize the situation of arjuna that is what that was put in is that he was a very good ignorant person mm -hmm. so just because somebody is good that doesn't mean he is not in ignorance one may be in ignorance at the same time manifest some symptoms of goodness that shows goodness is also ignorance on the whole but among the three modes of nature that is goodness passion ignorance goodness is a very good platform for understanding the knowledge of the soul that is why krishna made arjuna present himself in this world to all of us as a very good ignorant person yeah, it's a seeming contradiction goodness and ignorance yeah, in fact in the purport prabhupad also elaborates on this very nicely put so from here arjuna gives a quite a few reasons as to why he does not fight i really like in one of your lectures you said arjuna is confused but even his confusion is organized confusion so i really like that in fact it is very systematic how arjuna presents his confusion and in the course of uh, presenting his reasons arjuna in 37th shloka he is saying lobo pahata chetasaha these people this duryodhana and his party their chetana has been hijacked by the nature of greed and because of which they are not seeing any fault even killing their own family members 
so even in the world right now there is so much of greed it is really war ridden and because of greed there are so many violence and so, so many uh, atrocious things that's happening so prabhu what is the nature of greed which makes one go to any extent even to the extent of killing one's own family members just for the sake of fulfilling their own selfish desires now arjuna telling that duryodhana is overcome by, by greed and uh, that greed is making him even to kill his own family members mm-hmm. one may think that what arjuna is speaking is knowledge but in spite of these wonderful teachings mm-hmm. or wonderful thoughts in the mind of arjuna krishna says to arjuna you are a fool so this shows the spirituality is far higher than morality so arjuna wanted to show his moral principles and then say that duryodhana is a bad person i am a good person everybody should be like good person like me no, actually krishna presented arjuna as a very good person and then told the entire world even such a good person like arjuna is also a fool that shows just being a good person is not going to give you any benefit mm-hmm. it is not the perfection of life the perfection of life is to transcend goodness so if you just have bhagavad gita first chapter as the entire bhagavad gita people would think that arjuna is very good and we have to be like arjuna only in the second chapter will come to know even the so called teachings of arjuna has been declared by krishna as foolish as ignorant so whether you are very good in this world or very bad in this world you both of you are in this world only that is what is happening in this world those are very good people they are trying to say he is a bad person because of it but that is not going to give solution you are teachings on the platform of goodness or moral teachings are not going to improve the situations of this world only transcendental teachings by krishna are the thing which are going to improve the situation of this world morality is very good but that cannot by itself or uh, it has no power in itself to change a person's heart who is in ignorance until unless the transcendental teachings of krishna are accepted then only there will be change in this world amazing so <clears throat> towards the end like from verses 39 to 43 we get to see arjuna's brilliant i mean it's really even somebody writes phd thesis i don't think they can come up with like this it's a brilliant analysis of social consequences of war he says if war happens then this will happen and this will happen it's like an amazing flow chart so it's astonishing to see how far sighted arjuna is and also his ability to state these things just on the spur of the moment it's not like he's taking time to write down these things and say he's just on the spur he's coming up with this and he mentions the very first effect of adharma going up adharma bhi bhavat krishna pradushyanti kulastriya kulastri will become pradushyanti contaminated so what is this that women becoming corrupt degraded the first effect of adharma going up is on the women so how do we understand what are the symptoms that women are degraded how are these connected let us compare adharma to be um and the quiet mm-hmm. just theoretically and uh, women to be a treasure which you have hidden in your house a great treasure now when the decoits attack your house where will they attack they go to the kitchen and try to steal no. utensils right the first attack is on the treasure right. isn't it the same way adharma attacks women mm. because once the woman become corrupt the whole world will become corrupt because they are the first guru for the entire world who is the first guru for every everyone mother mother 
So if the mother has become corrupt, they, the mother will produce all corrupt children only. Mm -hmm. So adharma, the best way or the easiest way for adharma to uh, to propagate itself is to corrupt the woman. Mm -hmm. So very simple. So if you want to uh, destroy a nation, destroy the character of a woman. Mm. So then she'll produce all characterless children, and then they'll have what happen, and then the whole world become a whole country become characterless. Mm -hmm. If you have weak women, then you have weak children, and the whole population becomes weak. So that is why in the Vedic system, uh, the women are protected not because they are weak. Mm. Because they're important. The wrong concept, which the British and other so called uh, Indologists they project the Vedic culture as saying that women are weak. Uh, that is what people have thought in the Vedic times in India. That is why there are so many protection to them. No, it is not because of that. The Prime Minister is giving the highest protection. Why? Right? Because not because he's weak, because he's most important. Mm. You protect your jewelry with so much of uh, care, not because your jewelry is weak, it's because of being important. The most important uh, in our society are, are women, because they become mothers. And motherhood is the most important treasure in the entire world, because she is she who nourishes the child and brings up a good child. Wow. Actually, in real time, as we speak, this can be controversial, but in the name of feminism, I know there are some good aspects of feminism, but the pseudo-feminism part, especially the Western influence, motherhood had attacked at every single level, from the use of contraceptives to abortions, and then after that, also after having a child in the name of wanting to pursue the corporate dreams, leave the children under somebody else's care, seeing the child as a burden. So pretty much at every level, motherhood is being attacked. And so what you said, Pradushyanti Kulastriya, huh? this loss of motherhood is really actually such a great loss. So the immediate effect, Prabhu, of this is Varna Sankara, unwanted children. So when we say unwanted children, so I think you kind of briefly touched upon this right now. Is there anything that you want to add for Varna Sankara, the bad population in the society, unwanted progeny? Whenever there is somebody brings the news to me and say, you know, there's a truck accident and there was a plane accident, 30 people died or 50 people died, there's an uh, encounter with a terrorist and uh, this happened and then that happened. I always ask the one question. Every day in Mumbai, at least according to the news which I got about 20 years back by one of the gynecologists, mm -hmm. is every day in Mumbai, officially 45,000 thousand babies are killed. God. Mm. Why don't you talk about it? Mm. Why it doesn't come in the news? Mm. It is not that unwanted children they come after they are given birth, but mm -hmm. in the womb itself they are killed. Oh. They are killed. Um, don't you think so? That it is a big sin very much. Just because the baby is not born and you can kill and then say, I have not murdered. Mm -hmm. so that is called unwanted children. Right. Motherhood is destroyed. Yes. By, by the sin. Yes. yes. So Prabhu, uh, I want to know, you did say that uh, Arjuna is this combination of good, ignorant, he's a good, ignorant person. But even to become this good, I mean, like, how come he is this good? If somebody offends us even in some small way, it is so difficult for us to forgive them, let go of it. We carry it in our hearts for so long. But here is Arjuna. And he is willing to forgive even such atatainas, aggressors. What not they have done? They have done unthinkable ways to harm him and his family. But here he is saying, Yadi maam apratikaram ashastram shastrapanayaha, I will not resist, I will give up the weapons, but if they want, let them come with the weapons and kill me. I think that is better for me. So this level of goodness, I mean, like, how come he is this good? So when Krishna told Arjuna, you'd say, I'm not going to fight. They are, they are going to fight. They have the shastras in their hand. Mm. Then Arjuna, he says to Krishna, 
for the sin which I have done. For the sin which I have done. What is that sin? To mentally even think of killing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thought of killing them. That sin has to be repented by me. By giving up my arms. Ashastram. Shastra Pranayaha. They are having Shastra in their hands. Let them kill me. So, this high level of goodness of Arjuna is because he is a devotee of Krishna. At the same time, Krishna is projecting Arjuna in front of us that until unless you come to this high level of goodness, knowledge of the soul, spiritual knowledge will not enter your heart. No. So, this high level of goodness is manifested in four qualities. Of course, this is a subject matter for the second chapter. It was in the sixth verse of the second chapter. These four qualities are there. Number one is that he has controlled his mind and senses. Number two is he is taller than like Shabi Hello. Number three is Uparati. That means he is indifferent. Number four is Shraddha. Mm. First, we'll talk about these four things in the next chapter. Right. But as long as somebody has not developed these four qualities, it is very difficult for him to understand the knowledge of the self. That is why Krishna made Arjuna project himself as a person mode of goodness rather than his own path to Right, right. So this is a good segue for the next question. I was going to ask you exactly that. Because usually many, many people think by reading Bhagavad Gita, I will become a good person. But here, you just mentioned, and Prabhupada is also writing in the very last purport, he's saying such a kind and soft-hearted person in the devotional service of the Lord is fit to receive self-knowledge. So here it is said, goodness is a prerequisite to become self-realized or receive the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. So clearly, seems like, not seems like it is, Bhagavad Gita has a much higher objective. Morality is not the goal of Bhagavad Gita. So what is that higher objective of Gita, spirituality in general? I have already told you in the previous, uh, when you talked about the sweetness of the Lord and the greatness mm -hmm. of the Lord. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you have a rasgulla in front of you, what do you say? I love it. Mm -hmm. When you have a... Uh, um, big, strong wrestler in front of you. You don't say, I love you. So, I revere it. So, the purpose of Bhagavad Gita is that Krishna wants to manifest his sweetness to the entire world so that people will start loving him. Mm -hmm. So, that is the purpose of Bhagavad Gita. That is what Krishna wants us to do in the end of the Bhagavad Gita. He says, Manmana, Mad Bhakto, Madhyagi, Mam Namaskuru, Mami Vaishyanti, Pratijane, Priyosime. You become very dear to me, and I become very dear to you. That is the purpose. Love for Krishna and the purpose of Bhagavad Gita. Amazing. Okay. So Prabhu, sometimes people say that since in chapter one, Krishna hardly speaks. He only speaks like half a shloka, but that also indirectly through Sanjaya. So many people say, why read uh, chapter 1? We'll just go to uh, where Bhagavan Uvacha, where Krishna speaks in chapter 2. So is it okay if they skip chapter 1 or why should they actually read chapter 1 and then move on to chapter 2? So they can do anything mm -hmm. but read Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> okay. Every verse of Bhagavad Gita is as valuable as other words. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like this is important, that is not important. It is not your book of uh, of uh, of your studies which you are doing in school or college. This is very important question. It may come in the exam. It's not like that. Okay. Bhagavad Gita is sweet, like Rasgulla. Mm. You lick any part of Rasgulla, that is sweet only. It is not that this part is sweet, that is not so, it is not important. You, it's up to you. It's up to you. So, but the significance of the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita is it will make you fixed up in studying any chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Like you have a foundation of a, of a house or a building. So that foundation makes you fixed up or makes the building fixed up. So if you want to be fixed up in studying Bhagavad Gita, 
uh, then you require the foundation for it. Uh, that is why the first chapter has its a significance. Though many of the Acharyas have not given elaborate purpose to it, mm -hmm. but we have Bhagavad Gita, first chapter purports elaborately were given by Krishna, mm -hmm. by Prabhupada. Because in the previous ages, in the previous ages, people had that kind of goodness where people could directly enter the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. But now, the goodness means to understand this material world is miserable and this material world is temporary. And many of them in the past, they had this concept, but these days people don't have this concept. They think I can enjoy this world, I can be happy in this world. So to convince a person, this world is not a place of enjoyment, not the world is a place where you can uh, have, permanently be there. To bring a person to the level of goodness where he can receive the knowledge of self, this Bhagavad Gita first chapter becomes a prerequisite. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, Prabhu, how is the war of Kurukshetra different from the current day wars? There is a war right now happening between Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine. There's violence in Bangladesh, not like a war, but violence. There is almost like a civil war breaking out in UK. People are so frustrated. So, how is this war of Kurukshetra different from all of these? It is like the, these days war is like a war between Ravana and Hiranyakashipu. Whom will you support? Neither. So it's like that. Because both are on the side of adharma and supporting one is like supporting one kind of adharma mm -hmm. and supporting other is supporting other kind of adharma. If you are against uh, uh, some person or some, some country which is fighting a war, you are against that adharma of the person through the adharma of yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is just ignorance, one kind of ignorance fighting with other kind of ignorance. Yes. 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 So Prabhu, before uh, I let you go, I have a round called Brahmastra round. So because this is all about battlefield and war, so we are calling it Brahmastra. Basically, it's uh, rapid fire. So I will be asking you about a dozen questions. So unlike the questions we discussed until now, uh, you don't have to give elaborate answers. You can give like uh, concise answers, but very quick. Because it's Brahmastra, you have to counteract them quickly. No time to think. So according to you, what is Srila Prabhupada's greatest contribution to this world? Books. Very nice. And of all the Srila Prabhupada's books, which one is your favorite? Bhagavad Gita. Okay. And of the 18 chapters in Bhagavad Gita, which chapter do you find most interesting? Well, Twelfth, okay. If you could spend a day with any spiritual leader within ISKCON, outside ISKCON, anywhere, spiritual leader, past or present, who would it be? Sri Madhvacharya. Okay. If you could travel back in time and give one piece of advice to the younger Kamalochan who had just joined ISKCON as a new Bhakta, what would you tell him? You wasted your life studying all your marine engineering. Okay. So, besides Krishna and Arjuna, who is your most favorite character in Mahabharata? Bhima. Bhima. Why? This is not part of Brahmastra. Just out of curiosity, I must say. Because he is, he is very dear to Krishna, which is not very explicitly known. <laughs> Most powerful. Oh, interesting. Maybe in some other episode we can bring this up and discuss. Okay. Uh, a quality that you admire the most in your Guru Maharaj, His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj? Tolerance. Okay. What is the most challenging part of being a monk? To be a monk. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, what is the most important quality a spiritual seeker should develop? Inquisitiveness. Oh, 
wonderful so they should listen to pariprashna if you could uh, i already if you could travel with shrila prabhupad to any country that he had not visited during his time and you are getting to travel with him so where would you go along with shrila prabhupad country or yeah, a place yeah. any country but he had not gone during his time so now he is taking you with you him so where would you go yeah i had to find out where pope did not go i would definitely would try to go to australia pope went to australia yes and uh, yeah i still scratch my head where pope which country pope did not go okay but he gone to many countries so if you would say in india then i would have come because i am very poor in the international geography uh uh-huh. but in india i would have said i would have taken i would have traveled uh, with prabhupad to udupi oh very nice very nice amazing i don't know the prabhupad traveled to udupi or not i think uh-huh. I, i think he's not gone okay so i would have traveled to udupi along with prabhupad beautiful very nice lovely if you could give a bhagavad gita class because you give so many classes now if you could give a bhagavad gita class to any one current world leader now this could be political leader business leader any leader who would you choose and why would you give bhagavad gita class to this leader to modi oh very nice because i would i, I would ask him to uh, uh, spread the message of bhagavad gita around the world correct yeah he's very good real message of bhagavad gita around the world very good choice if you could say thank you to any one of your god brothers god sisters someone in iskon who has been who has been there for you since your beginning days as a friend as a mentor so who would you say thank you to my guru maharaj oh very nice okay last question saving the best for the last prasadam or philosophy if you could choose only one what would you choose the prasadam of philosophy oh wow <laughs> brilliant fantastic the prasadam of philosophy amazing so prabhu before i let you go uh, in conclusion what are some of the important lessons one can learn from first chapter just a quick few lessons that they can take away from this episode it's not enough just to be good don't depend on your material assets for solving the problems of your life it's only krishna who can solve the problems of life by his teachings in the bhagavad gita amazing amazing so prabhu uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart this is just the first episode now i cannot wait to deep dive into other remaining chapters and uh, it was so insightful i personally learned a whole lot and you have given us a lot of food for thought so thank you so very much prabhu and if you could just uh, hold on for a minute i'll just conclude so those of you who are viewing pariprashna so thank you so much for watching until the end so if you can kindly if you think that you got any value out of this pariprashna please spread the message share this video with as many people as you can so they also can become part of pariprashna they can also join us on this journey of uh, inquiry into bhagavad gita and if you would like to give some feedback what did you think of this episode what did you like what can we improve if you have any questions for kamal lochan prabhu please put them in the comment section and we'll definitely try to take them up and also if you want to be keep uh, notified if you want to receive notifications about all the different things that we do related to bhagavad gita i will leave our exclusive whatsapp group link aradhana online group link in the description of the youtube video if you can kindly click on that you will become a part of our group and there you will be notified of all the future episodes of pariprashna and whatever else we do related to bhagavad gita so thank you so very much so here at the end of chapter 1 arjuna has sat down he has put his gandiva down and he is grief stricken so what is arjuna going to do next is he going to get up and do something or is he going to stay there and continue to lament that we will find out in the next episode until then stay inquisitive and stay krishna conscious hare krishna, krishna.